I believe it was said by David, I was happy when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. There's just something about Sunday school that the other parts of the service doesn't have any other time through the day. Amen. We have just uh, awakened up from a good night's rest and, and we just feel different. And you're refreshed and ready for the day. Now we understand that uh, last night we asked uh, the peoples if they had a church of their, that they was attending while uh, visiting or, or mean regular members of churches, that they should attend their own church this morning. Because we... Being an interdenominational, we just don't like to take people from their own congregation. And I've been accused a lot of times of, of condemning other churches. That's wrong. I do not condemn other churches. I condemn many times things that, that they condone, but I certainly don't condemn the church. But many times when they uh, teach things that's contrary to the scriptures then I, I condemn that. And then when they do things that's sinful and, and permit it to be done in their churches, I condemn that. But uh, never, just like it said, I have many Catholic friends sitting here, and I never condemn the Catholic people. I condemn the doctrine of the Catholic Church because I don't believe it's scriptural. And no more than I condemn them than I do many of the Protestant denominations because I do not think it's scriptural. And I am duty-bound to stand for what's truth. And you know, God will appreciate you if you'll be honest, just Amen. sincere. You know, a lot of times man seeking wife, a real man that's got man behind him, uh, he does not altogether look for the girl that's so... Uh, so pretty in the face or so forth. Because he knows that'll be lost one of these days. See? He looks for the woman that's woman in personality. A real woman. See? And if she's loyal and a real woman, that man will appreciate her. I don't care how much of a, a bad fellow he is and how much he runs around with, with bad women... There isn't a bad man in the world, but what will appreciate a woman that'll stand for what woman really should be. That's right. Because he appreciates that. And that's the way it is by, by preaching the word. If a man will stand but just what he believes. Now, not, you remember, God knows your heart. And if you'll stand by what you really believe to be the truth, then you can have faith in what you're talking about. Uh, I've got a couple of good friends here. Brother Charlie Cox, I see, studying out there. And the last few weeks I've been down in Kentucky with him squirrel hunting where I got some rest. Brother Banks Woods and uh, we training in our rifles, they... Uh, I just got to have mine so perfect that it'll drive a tack at 50 yards or I, I just can't hunt. See, that's all. Well, what good does it do to drive the tack? See, because if you're shooting at the squirrel, a head shot, and his head's probably that big around, anywhere within an inch group will be all right. See, anywhere in there, either one of those boys, that's all right, I get the squirrel. They go on and get the squirrel. But to me, it's got to be just perfect. It's got to hit the tack. It can't miss it a quarter of an inch. It's got to hit the tack solid. Or I just get all nervous and upset. And I was sitting down the other day in the woods and I was saying, oh, Lord, well, why am I such a crank? Well, why did you make me to be such a crank? I said, now there, uh, Brother Banks went hunting with his rifle and he pulled it up to shoot it in with the telescope sights and you just... Every once in a while, you'd, one will go off because if it, a factory loaded ammunition will do that anyhow because you've got a little more powder and a little less powder. But it would just uh, hit a little bit off for an inch or two. Brother Banks said, oh, that's all right. I hit squirrel. That's all right. You don't, you don't bother him. Charlie, the same way. But 
I, mine's got to hit the tack right in the center or it upsets me. I said, I become a regular crank. And then I begin to look back and I find that my life is like that. That's my makeup. And I thought, well, why did you make me like that? It even makes me nervous if, uh, if it goes off just a little bit that way or that way. And that's the way then the Lord revealed to me sitting down there uh, up on Glutton Holler everywhere we is that hunting that I believe it's called Dutton but the squirrels eat so fast I call it Glutton so they uh, up on this place I thought that's it I would not even teach that there was a hell until I was positive of it and therefore if the scripture predicts divine healing and here it looks like this and like that if a Scripture says, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like there's three gods and there, I see there's only one. And now, how am I going to just haphazardly about some other man's, what they say about it, take it like that? If the Bible speaks of predestination and grace, and here it's got works and here it's got grace, and I, I just can't preach it like that. I got to solve that and through and through and through the Bible till it's perfectly driving a tank. Yeah. Till it really comes out perfectly through the Scriptures. Amen. Then when I stand, I can really have faith in what I'm doing. Yeah. Know that what you're preaching is the truth. Yeah. And then if anybody gets contrary about it, you've already studied enough to you know just exactly what he says or to stop him at. See, right here. See. And that's the way it is. God makes us different ways. That we can just simply, uh, that makes the world that way. But that's what makes me that nervous, upset type of a person. It's got to be just right. And I'm so glad tonight, today, this, this morning, to say that I know that the Lord Jesus is not dead. Amen. He is a living. And he's just as much right here now as he was any time in the world at Galilee or anywhere else. He's a living, resurrected, omnipresent son of the living God. That's, and if I couldn't, if I taught a scripture of some historical God and I wasn't sure that he was right here. Uh, I, I'd be all confused and make me so nervous I wouldn't know what I was doing. See? Now, I wouldn't know where to tell people, well, I, he'll do this or he'll do that. I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. But when you know what he promised he would do and have seen him do it, then you know where you're standing. See? And see how God in his great uh, plans just know how to make every person just exactly to be a certain thing because he's going to use them for that purpose. You're that little lady up here a while ago, Mrs. Stricker, singing without any music. She had some kind of a little thing she was blowing through to get her tune or, or key or whatever you call it. And could stand and sing with that real low voice and raise it up that ship ahoy. Now, you ought to hear me try that sometime. <laughs> it would be terrible. <laughs> But you see, God know just how to make that woman up so she'd do that. And that's the way we all have different makeups. If we would just find our position in Christ and there abide and serve Him. Amen. See a little girl sitting here this morning in a wheelchair. Bless your little heart. What's crippled you up, honey? Muscle, uh, the dis, the dis, oh, I can't say that word when it gets started. The dystrophy or whatever. Is that what it is, sweetheart? It's made you a cripple? Or is it polio? Polio? You know, Jesus heals little girls, doesn't he? You're a mighty pretty little girl. And I believe Jesus lets you get well. Last night, those two little girls that was sitting here with that disease that not even a person in the world knows what it is. Their little fingers drop off and their little feet dropped off too, pretty little girls. And I happen to know their mother and their grandmother and just felt led to condemn that devil that would torment them little things sitting there right out. 
And they've been in wheelchairs for I don't know how long. And last night, the news comes sweeping in over the line. The little girls are up walking around. You see that? At the, at the Lord God was so graciously to them. Oh, He's so good to us. <laughs> we should appreciate Him more. Then I was thinking just last night after I had went home and laying down for a few minutes, I was thinking of... Uh, when the soul has gone out of a man, what is it? It's his inner being that has moved out. He's not dead. He's, he's still alive. See, he, he lives forever. And our loved ones who have passed on beyond this veil is in a, a body that we don't know what it is. It isn't revealed. There's three stages of everything. There's a stage of the mortal body, the immortal body, and then the glorified body. See? Just like uh, other things, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit goes in one channel, and the three makes the one. Justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost in a channel makes the one. And, and soul, body, and spirit makes the one. And uh, it travels in threes, and threes are ones. And take a, a three-part piece of glass and lay it in the sun... It will reflect the colors, yet seven colors will come down to one. And you take red and look to red at red. How many knows what color it will be? White. Mm -hmm. Isn't that strange? That red through red looks white. Red is a sign of redemption. And when you God looks at our red sins through the red blood of His precious Son, they're white. So, but he has to look through the blood. If it doesn't, they are sinful. So we have to be under the blood. And when the soul leaves the body, it takes its journey into a place of rest in a body that's in the form and shape of this body, but it isn't this type of body. You meet your loved ones, you couldn't shake their hands. You can talk to them. You can look at them. They look just like they do here. Because when Peter and John and James saw Moses and Elijah, they recognized them on Mount Transfiguration. But it's a body. But then when that a body, a kind of a celestial body, when it returns back to the earth, it picks up the, the substance that it once lived in. And then it becomes a glorified body. And that body is the one that we'll see the Lord Jesus and His resurrected body. It does not yet appear what we shall be, said Paul. But we know we shall have a body like His own glorious body, for we shall see Him as He is. Amen. All these old wrinkled hands and broken down tissues will all fade away into the splendor of youth. Amen. You old men and women, remember you, this is, that, that's a mark of the fall, your old age. But in the resurrection, there'll not be one mark of anything of sin. But why did God make you like he did? He brought you to a certain age. When you was about 22, 23 years old, you were your best. You were eating food and getting stronger and healthy and what a powerful looking person you was. Then after that, you become wrinkling away. See, death set in. But in the resurrection, all old age will be wiped away. I'm looking here at a little old preacher and his wife. They're in their 80s, I guess. Brother and sister kid. Preaching the gospel perhaps before I was born. And I'm an old man. And I see him sitting here, peaceful looking little old couple. And I just think that in the resurrection, what they'll look like. Them old wrinkles and shaking hands of trembling and palsy and gray hairs will fade away into the splendor of youth. Praise the Lord. It really pays to serve the Lord. Amen. It really does. Praise God. We'll see him someday. Wonder if Rosella Griffin is present. I like to get her to say a word. A little alcoholic that was uh, just 
healed uh, at uh, here a few years ago, and that might help some alcoholic each year. Had to go home this morning. All right. Um, wonderful case. I thought last night I should have had her to say something I would if I'd have knew it. If she was going this morning. So many things. I just like the folks at the tabernacle to hear. Now, uh, is there any here to be baptized this morning in uh, water? Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six. About six or seven here to be baptized. And uh, the baptismal service will follow this Sunday school lesson. Now, the Sunday school room for our sister Arnold, for her little tots, has been cut out. And we'll just, if you will, sister Arnold, we'll just almost have to postpone that until the following uh, day because we don't have the room for the school. And I'll uh, read some scripture here in a few minutes for the little children. And that'll give them something to think of too. And then next Sunday, you'll continue on with your regular services and the Sunday school. Yes. Now, um, uh, we want to say, uh, here's another thing I want to say this morning. I, I, I told them not to do this, but they did it anyhow. <laughs> that was an offering last night. They come to me, <laughs> an offering. I told them not to do that, see. And uh, they, but they did it anyhow. And when I didn't know it until Billy told me that my brother Doc had brought it to him over to his house. And I've never counted it yet, but I believe that it was reported that there was about 300 or a little over 300. Is that, you remember Doc, what it was? What was that, brother? 324.12. I thank you very much. Now, I've been off from work a long time, you know that. And my secretary being president, or some of them here this morning, knows that my expenses, no matter where I am, right here at home, runs me over a hundred dollars a day of my offices and things to take up for handkerchiefs and things around the world and expenses. And I, I want to say this in an encouragement to you people here, old. For the amount of people, that's the biggest offering that I ever received in my life. Do you realize that would amount to around a dollar a piece average? And most any of the offerings out in the work will average about around about 22 or 25 cents per person. But this was on the average of a dollar a person. Because I know you can't get in here. They don't take the offerings on the outside. And you can't jam in this little place over about 300 people. I, I doubt. Do you know what the tabernacle seats, Brother Neville? It ought to be somewhere around 300 where it is now. About 300 people. So see, that's around a, a dollar a piece. God knows how I appreciate that. I thank you very much. And it goes right straight into the work of the Lord. I, I thank you for it. And for the, if some of them had to be leaving before night, cause, and I, when I went home last night, sitting on the porch was a little box like this, and it was a, a bunch of jelly, I believe, that come from someone. You know, I just love jelly. <laughs> and I, I appreciate that. And a, a sister here, who I better not call her name. She's a bosom friend of our family. And she left a love gift down at my mother's for me and for Billy. You don't know, sister, how I appreciate that and what a, a time it comes in and all, so many things you understand. And I'm sure that he understands. And so I just trust that he'll bless each one of you yes, exceedingly abundantly. I wish it was so that I could go home with each one of you and, and stay with you a little while and talk with you. I love to do that, but it's, you know how it is. It's just constantly on the move. We just got to go swiftly. Frankly, right after the service tonight, the Lord willing, I'll leave the state just as soon as the service closes. I've got to get out of here before 12 o'clock. I got an appointment at 12 o'clock. I got a full this afternoon and I, you know how it is. It's just constantly on the go all the time. People sick, dying, and Many times I go into a place and just be standing there and somebody come in and say, You know me, Brother Brennan? No, I don't. 
Well, I was laying in the hospital dying when you come prayed for me. The Lord healed me. I was blind when you met me on the street that day the vision come. See? And I, I never know what it is. But I'm thinking this one blessful thought, Brother Egan, that someday when I have preached my last sermon, I prayed for the last person that the Lord wants me to pray for. And I go home. And on that resurrection morning, oh, what a day that will be. The joy. When I can stand there when the Queen of the South shall come up, I can see what influence she had. I'll see coming up there Billy Graham, the influence he had. Old Roberts and all the rest of the Sankey, Finney, Moody, Calvin, Knox, and so forth. Then I see my group come up. <laughs> That's going to be the joy. That's going to be my crowning. Amen. That's right. And by the grace of God, I hope to have several million there. And, and I've got to go overseas pretty soon. And I, as far as I know, right in our own meetings, just think of it. I'm in my second million souls went into Christ. Amen. I, I hope that I see many, many millions won. Praise God. Now the baptismal service and now the, uh, the appointments and things. And now this is continually after the meeting. If any time you're coming back for private interview or so forth, just call the agent, uh, Brother Mercer here. We have to have some sort of a setup that we have to. We know that. And Brother Mercer, he gets them down. He puts them down just as he come. And as soon as I run out of appointments, all of them run out. I, when I come in, I call him up and tell him I'm finished on that group. He gives me a new group and away I go again, you see. And that all works out of that office. And he knows just how to set them up so he can get each one in that can get in, you see. So we're very... Uh, happy to have this little office operating the way it is. So that's just Butler 21519. And that's, or if you call Jeffersonville, just call for me and they'll answer there at that office. And thank you very kindly. Now, let us just, before we open up his blessed word, and remember immediately after this service is over and the baptismal service, Billy will be here to give out prayer cards for tonight. Now, tonight being a church night, Sunday night, the most of the city people will be out in their own churches and around Louisville and around. They'll be in their own churches, but it'll just be mostly the outsiders. Therefore, I think maybe we can line up a great prayer line tonight and pray for every one of them. I'm trusting that we will. We've got quite a few prayer cards out. Now, I think last night, after last night, Oh, I just felt like I was going to take uh, one of those little solo flights, you know, we talk of. <laughs> just to see in this little old tabernacle again, hands raised up. I got a little boy here. He's just all boy, a little Joseph. He's just about three years old. And when all of them are shouting, if he didn't jump right out there in the middle of the aisle, throw them hands up and get shouting and praising the Lord right out in the middle of the aisle out there. And... and um, I think this morning he got into it with his little sister and bit her on the arm. So I told him that his shot wouldn't do much good as long as he acted like that. <laughs> oh, my. Those little fellows, they can really get right next to you, can't they? But, of course, what it was, he just saw the rest of them doing it and thought that's just what he should do, too. And probably following after us, the <laughs> way we were doing Now... We got his word laying open here. Now let's just speak to him about it. Now just a minute. Dear God, as we come to thee just now, reverently, quietly, soberly, and in faith believing that you hear and will answer prayer, because we come in that all-sufficient name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus, who is the infallible one and gave the promise that if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Then we know that we will receive just what we ask for. For we come in His name. For we have no other name that we could approach you in. 
the great, mighty Jehovah God. And we come in His grace, not confessing that we deserve anything, but because that He has made a propitiation for us, in that He died for us and He atoned for our sins, and we feel that we can stand justified in your sight by His death. That is our faith. And asking for nothing that would be evil, but that which would be good for each of us. Therefore, Lord God, speak to us through thy word. And speak to us in that voice that we would understand and would know just how to be better men and women, boys and girls, knowing that the great gate yonder at death that every time our heart makes a beat, we just get one beat closer to that gate to which we all shall go in at. And then knowing that after we are in there, there is not one opportunity again to ever make reconciliations. There is never again that we can have this opportunity that we have just now. And not knowing just when we shall cross that line, oh God, come to us quickly and bring us to the senses that we should have and know how to approach Thee and to plead our case before Thee and ask for mercy. Grant it, Lord. We are a needy people. We are sheep calling on the shepherd that will lead us through life and down through the valley of the shadow of death. As David of old said, I'll not fear when I come to that place because the shepherd will lead me right on through that place until our feet rest solidly upon that glorious shore where old age and sickness and sorrow and death shall flee away from us and we shall be free there forever. Speak, Lord, this little bright-eyed darling of someone sitting here before me in this wheelchair. Just can't keep my eyes off of her today. All crippled up with this polio. What the evil one has did to her. Oh, God, bring deliverance to that little darling. Grant it, Lord, not only to her, but to others here who are waiting. Let thy Holy Spirit lift them so high this morning that they'll pass every vibration of doubt and every sin barrier. That your Holy Spirit might move upon them and heal them. Grant these things, Lord, for we ask these blessings for thy glory in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I have chosen for a text this morning. And you little fellows, forgive me for uh, taking the time all with the adults and your classes not here to be this morning. But I want you to hear also what I want to read. And I want to read this morning out of 1 Samuel, the third chapter. And I want to take for a text, Hear His Voice. That will do for little girls and big girls and little boys and big boys. All. Remember the text. Hear his voice. Now to you that's turning in the scriptures to 1 Samuel, the third chapter. 
This is how it reads for the first uh, ten verses. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Oh, how I would like to dwell there for a minute. Maybe some other time. It just strikes me. Let me just read it once again, that verse. And the child Samuel ministered in, unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. For there was no open vision. See what a vision is then? It's the direct word of the Lord. And the Lord's word was precious. And it came to pass at that time when uh, Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And here the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not. Lie down again. And he went and laid down. And the Lord, and the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I, here am I. For thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel. Samuel, and Samuel answered, Speak for thy servant here. The voice of God. Hearing his voice in that day was a rare thing. See, there was no open vision. And... It was a rare thing, the real voice of God. Because the people had gotten away, they had a church in that day that just didn't follow the commandments of the Lord. They had a a minister by the name of Eli. And he had got away from God, but just teaching the precepts of what the people wanted to believe. If that isn't parallel to this day. He just taught the people and he, he uh, took his choice ones and he had his sons to take the best of the flesh from the, the hooks out of the, the offering. And it just become a place where the offering was the main thing. And Samuel just careless about the way that he handled the commandments of the Lord. 
And the real Word of God was a rare thing. That's the way it is today. We go to church and we find the people going in and having some great drive on. Uh, we want to make our denomination this year so many more. Bring your letter from your other church and unite with us. And slogans like a million more and 44 and all such as that trying to outgrow the next denomination. And in doing so, we've let the bars down of the Bible. We've got away and begin to teach different things. The prophets spoke of these days that when they for teaching would teach the man's doctrine and not God's doctrine. And we've seen so much of that and it's gone on so long until today the Word of the Lord is a rare thing. That someone can come and say, Thus saith the Lord. Now we've had a lot of impersonations of that. Satan is really on the job. And many years gone by, people were afraid to say that unless it was the Lord. But today, they just don't care. But it's a rare thing to hear the voice of the Lord. And to find a person that can say, the Lord spoke to me. You notice that amongst the people anymore. That they hardly hear a time that when they say the Lord spoke to me. When men and women used to pray all night. And their homes were set in order by the book of the Lord. And God was first in their home. See, we got too many things ahead of the Lord. You can't have the prayer meeting because Mr. Godfrey's on tonight. <laughs> You can't have the prayer meeting before we love Susie's on tonight. Or some kind of a foolish nonsense like that that takes up the time and we don't have time to hear the voice of the Lord. And those who do claim to be Christians just kneel down to the little prayer like this kind of homemade Lord, bless me and my family and take care of us. Good night. And the next morning rise and say, uh, Just guide us through the day. Good day. We should wait on the Lord. You see, we do all the talking. We don't give Him a chance to talk back to us. That if we would pray and pray until our soul comes into the presence of God. And then just relax and listen to His voice. But there's so many voices today that takes the voice of the Lord away from us. There's a voice of pleasure. So many people are listening to that. Where they can go and have a good time. And many of them are professing to be Christians. Some kind of an old rock and roll coming up. They just can't listen to what God... They, they say, well, I'm a Christian. I'll read a verse in the Bible today. Yeah, uh, Jesus wept. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> go ahead. But then to really get down and pray... They got too many other things to do. There's so many voices in the world. So many things to attract our attention from God. And yesterday when the wife and I had run over to the uh, supermarket to get some groceries. And I was hurrying because I was late with appointments and things and rushing real quick and 
There was a little boy standing there half asleep. And a little old girl come along there with some little trousers on that belonged to some man. They had to. Because they were made for man. And the Bible says it's an abomination in the sight of God for a woman to wear it. And with a lot of this year, a lipstick on and her eyes about half asleep, she said, where is the so-and-so to that little boy? He said, how do you expect me to know? She said, you remember, I never got in until six o'clock this morning and she wasn't over 12 years old. Now, Jesus at 12, which was our example, said, don't you know I should be about my father's business? No wonder the voice of God is a rare thing today. It's smothered out. But so many different voices. So many things that dim and take away. It's got to a place until it dulls our senses. Until we can't hear the voice of God. Our senses of where we are to shake ourselves and realize that you are men and women. And you are the creation of God. And you were put here to serve Him. But Satan's voice and false prophets. Oh, be modern. As I was speaking a few days ago, I was coming to church. And I turned my radio on and I heard a program out of Louisville. It said that they were teaching their children in churches. To just drink moderately. Making them modern. So that they won't go to the excess. Oh, they need to teach them Christ. Not drinking. And that will wreck and ruin and damn any home. How could the voice of God speak among a family that's half sows with whiskey and their minds paralyzed with smoking and drinking and all night long carousing? Man that waits upon God comes into his presence. And to come into the presence of God is just like going out early of a morning when the dew and the Honey suckles are all sweet. When you come in the presence of a person like that, you know they have been with God. My wife said to me, coming down this morning, she said, Billy, I don't mean to say this to flower to anybody, but she said, last night, I believe, or one of the nights, she said, I sat by one of the little Amish women. A little lady with a little cap on her head. She said, and you could tell that woman had been with Jesus. For she was sweet. Her soul was mellow. Her eyes were clear. There's nothing, no sin or nothing to hide behind or anything. She had been in the presence of God. Her senses wasn't dull by whiskey and tobacco and all kinds of things of the world. She was refreshed from the presence of God, reading her Bible, studying God's Word. But we modern Americans, what we do, and the false prophets behind the pulpit say that's all right. I'm... Uh, kind of in the notion of saying this. If I'm wrong, God forgive me. And I'm persuaded that a lot of them don't know God. And the congregation will never live any higher than this pastor. No wonder the scripture says, these shepherds, how they have scattered the flock. Woe unto them. They are the branches that bears not fruit which will be plucked off and burned. 
So many things to dull the senses of the people today. Oh, but in the midst of all that, in spite of every dulling and every voice that's in the world today, some of them pleasure voices, some of them are, are sinful voices to lure the people. But in the spite of every bit of that, the truth of God still remains. He that will hear my voice and come after me. Men and women who will hear the voice of God, God still waits to speak to every individual that will open their ears to hear God's voice. If a man who is a pastor, many times people say, couldn't you do this? Couldn't you run over here? Couldn't you do this? Oh, I love to do it. But I've got to stay in the presence of God if I'm going to do the thing right. Then people say, oh, Brother Branham's one of these isolationists. That's not it. I love people, but there's just thousands of them. But I must stay with him to find out what he'd have me tell him. Some were just listen. He'll have something for you that he wants you to know about. Pastor, don't you never get too busy. But what you can stay in the presence and listen for his voice. God always keeps his word. And no matter how bad the times may be, how much your church may teach against it, Jesus Christ is still willing to speak that still small voice to anybody that will listen for him. He's still ready to do it. If we just quieten ourselves, but we run in flustered and say, say, uh, pastor, could I join this church? What church do you come from? So and so. Well, bring us your letter. Oh, my. Could I join this church? Oh, yes. Come here forth and we'll sprinkle you a little bit with water and put your name on the book and you get the right hand of fellowship. Well, the Masonic Lodge has got a better order than that. It's true. The Masonic Lodge and all other lodges are all right. But it still isn't the house of God. There's where God speaks. Those lodges try to make him moral. But God makes you righteous to Jesus Christ, His Son. Now, there's a code of ethics to it. God has a new birth for you. But listen to His still, small voice. Every one of you people who profess to be Christians, get yourself quiet before Him. Don't let the washing hinder. Don't let the work hinder. Don't let nothing hinder. Don't let nobody know what you're doing. Just go before Him. Get up in the woods somewhere. Get out on the side of the road. Go into the secret closet and close the door. When the kids get to school, there, get down on your knees. You've heard all kinds of voices everywhere. But just get down and stay there until those voices are silenced. And you begin to lift up. It'll change you. It'll make you different. Like it did this little Samuel. It'll do something to you if you'll just do it. Now, it'll make you what you should be. It'll make you the kind of Christian that you ought to be. Now, let's just go back off of this modern day. Until a day that's past. Let's go back to the days of the early times. And this voice of God has come to man in all walks of life and all ages. No matter if you're a farmer, if you're a shoe cobbler, whatever you may be, God still speaks. If you're a sinner, if you're a prostitute, harlot, if you are a drunkard, if you are a local church member, nominal, nominal, whatever you might be, the voice of God still waits to speak to you. 
I'm thinking now of Moses. When he is already 80 years old and had 80 years of theological training and he knew the scriptures, he knew them well. And he had a promise to him that he was going to be the deliverer of his people. But yet, just knowing the scriptures and being a, a formal church member of that modern church in that day, he tucked the thing over in his own hands and tried to do it. He slew an Egyptian. You see what you do without listening to God? You just mess it up. And when the devil this morning would say, don't you be baptized? Another would say, oh, do it later. One would say, you better be sure you know what you're doing. And the other would say, you're going to lose a good time. The only way to settle that is go to God's Word with it. But people today don't seem to want to do that. And Moses, he had been to the best of the rabbis. But they'd got formal and cold. He had heard the story his mother told him of how that he was hid in the bulrushes and how that the big alligators couldn't get a hold of him. How that floating down that stream as that little baby where the, the old alligators were just fat. It's for the little children. They were fat from eating them little babies. They had old hook nosed women, police women, never did have a baby, didn't know how the love of a baby was. Or they just go out there and take and kill them little babies and throw them out in the river. Them old alligators were just fat on them little babies. And yet God put up on the mother's heart to place her baby right in death. Don't you see it was a type of Christ? He went right into death. And every one of them old alligators had come up to that Little bitty basket going down the river. You know why they couldn't do it? Why they couldn't eat that little baby? There was an angel sitting there. Get away from here. Mm. Why? God gives His angels charge to watch over His people. Don't you get scared, honey. God's watching you. The devil may try to do something to you, but God's greater. So alligators have to run away from that little basket. And yet Moses knew all these things. And yet after 40 years of training and then in the wilderness, he still tried to take the thing over in his hands. We know the Bible, what God says to do. And yet we say, well, now we'll make this be this way. It's just the days of miracles are not so anymore. We know we don't believe we see them anymore. And we believe the days of miracles is past. And the sprinkling is just as good as immersing. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is just as good as the name of the Lord Jesus. And so we'll just, the rest of them is going that way. So we'll just do that too. Moses had been a military man. And he thought that the way that he was trained as being a military man, that he could just kill them Egyptians off with his hand, be just as good as doing what God did. Did you ever think of it? Everybody condemns Moses for killing one man, and he come back down under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and kill the whole thing. Nobody said anything about it. He slew all of Pharaoh's army. But God was in it. God wasn't in the first one. And then Moses, just chuck full of church theology. He used to be the next Pharaoh. And we find him still not knowing God. But one morning on the backside of the desert, an old man of 80 years old, his whiskers hanging way down low. He seen a burning bush and he turned aside to see what was going on. And when he got near the bush, he heard a voice. God had to quieten him for 40 years before he could ever speak to him. And we won't stay quite 10 minutes so God can speak to us. With all the rumble and bumble we have of this day. 
And yet, Moses, after 40 years, stood there and in the presence of that bush and that one voice that called him, he knew more about God in five minutes after that than all the 80 years of training had taught him. It made a different man out of him. It'll make a different man and woman out of you if you'll just stand still long enough to hear his voice. Like Samuel did. Stand still. Don't be excited. If you want something of God, ask Him then stand still and listen and see what He's going to say about it. Just open up your heart. Say, what about it, Lord Jesus? Just stay there. If He doesn't answer the first five hours, then wait another. If He doesn't answer today, then He'll answer tomorrow. If He doesn't answer this week, He will next week. Stay there till He answers. Hear His voice speak back in your heart and say, Yes, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. That's all over. You hit settle that. See? I'm the Lord who forgives all thy sins. Now go and sin the more. I don't condemn you. Then you can go free. You're all right. But you want to be sure that you hear that voice speak. Moses heard it. He was a changed man. Look at Isaiah, the prophet. As a young man, he had it made. The great favor came to Zion in them days. A righteous man, a good man. He loved Isaiah for he knew he was a prophet. And so he just leaned upon the king's arm. Everything he had wanted, why? Well, Isaiah give it to him. And every time he wanted anything, well, the good king would give it to him. But there come a time that the king died. Prosperity always ruins people. That's a hard thing to say. But prosperity takes a man away from God. God spoke one place in the Bible something on this line. And He said, When I blessed you and gave you much, when you were poor and you didn't have nothing, I come to you. And you heard me. And you serve me, but when I bless you and give you plenty, then you turned your head from me. That's what America's done. Turn their heads. That's what the church has done. You can sit out on the corners and have the great fine buildings and the millions of dollars per, placed into it and everything just as easy as it can be. No wonder you haven't got time to hear God's voice. But wait till the hour comes when that's tucked away. <laughs> Then you'll long to hear it. Everything's fine now, but the hour's coming when it won't be that way. So Isaiah, he could lean upon the king's arm and he was a young man of favored, fine spirit in this young man. So the king loved him. And one day the props was knocked out from under him. The king died. And when the king died, then Isaiah had to go alone. And then he began to look around and he found out that everybody wasn't like the king. You'll be kicked out some of these days from these interdenominationals like this. It'll come a time when you'll have to belong to an organization or you can't worship. As you know, the scripture says it will be. They just make fun of you now. But there'll be a time where there'll be a boycott. For the mark of the beast must come. You'll either belong to the confederation of the churches, the beast like it is in Rome, or you won't worship at all. That's what the scripture says. That's when you have to cry out like Isaiah did. And he got out in the temple and he realized that and he raised his hands and he said, Oh Lord, I am a man of unclean lips. You think you're good, but wait till that time comes. I dwell among peoples of unclean lips. What did he got desperate? And when you get desperate about this thing, something will take place. You're not desperate enough. Oh, well, I joined church. That settles it. But you have to be desperate about it. You have to really need God. 
Jesus said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But as long as you're satisfied with the things of the world, how can God ever speak to you? You say, God never spoke to me. Why? He wants to. But you're too filled up with the things of the world. That's what's the matter with us today. We put all of our time on things of the world and the pleasures of the world and give no time to God. It's true. Now, we find out that Isaiah got desperate and he screamed out and confessed his sins and confessed the sins of the people. When he got to confessing, he heard a noise up above him. And when he looked up, there was the cherubims flying back and forth through the building. Amen. Wings over their faces and wings over their feet. And flying with wings, crying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Something was taking place. Isaiah got desperate. God come on the job. And Isaiah screamed, I have unclean lips. For a voice had just spoke. It changed him. Who will go for us? Said the voice. Who will go? Who's willing to stand in the breach amongst this bunch of theologians? Who will go in this day and claim that I'm still God? Who will go and condemn their uncleanness? Who will tear down their denominations and build the powers of the living God again? Who will go? Isaiah said, Lord, before I can go, I've got to be alternated. <laughs> Some of these little fears and frustrations had to leave him. So will it be with every individual God calls. You've got to be born again, changed and made new. Not imagination, but from your heart. Something that really takes place. And one of the angels, if you ask, you shall receive. One of the angels went over to the brazen altar and took the tongs and reached over and got a coal of living fire and ran over to Isaiah and placed it in his mouth. Said, now you're clean, go speak the word. Isaiah was changed after he heard that voice. Then in his late years, he wrote a complete Bible. He started at Genesis and ended up in Revelations. There's 66 books of the Bible. There's 66 chapters of Isaiah. Why? Because he got desperate in a time where he's seen it and needed most. Daniel, down in Babylon, as we spoke of him last night, he had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the Babylonian doctrines. But one day down there, Daniel got in need. And he knew he wanted to hear the voice of God. Yet he had the scriptures. But he needed to hear the voice of God. And he went down to the such river. And he just didn't go down there and park his chariot and kneel down in the bulrushes and say, Lord God, I want to hear you. Where are you at? No, you don't do it that way. Isaiah had tucked his chariot and the drivers and it went down to the river and sent them back. He was going to stay till he heard. That's the way. He got desperate about it. He had to get plumb away from all of the soldiers and all the astronomers and the wise men. All the doctors of theology and so forth that was trying to tell him, this you do this, Daniel, you do this, Daniel. But he got away from all of it. That's what you got to do. And he got down on the river and he stayed there for 21 days. Wrestling with the angel of the Lord. But we are told that he looked out upon the waters. There he saw an angel standing with his foot on the land and the sea. And raised up his hands and swore by him that lives forever and ever. 
when the things that Daniel saw come to pass, time should be no more. He had been delayed 21 days because of the evil of the land. And if he had delayed 21 days because of the evil of that land, in the days of Persia, what would he be in this day? How long could he be delayed? But that undying faith, that hunger and desire in the human heart that won't say no to God, but will hold on until God speaks from heaven. You can't play with this, with the gospel. It's not to be played with. It must hit the tack ten times out of ten. It's got to be perfect. Heart isn't right and it won't work. It's got to be perfect. Daniel prayed. We find in the Bible in about the 8th chapter, 7th or 8th chapter of of the book of Acts that a little self-made Pharisee by the name of Saul. Oh, he was a theologian, all right. He had sat under the teaching of Gamaliel. And he had all the scriptures right down in the way it should be according to the theologians of that day. Oh, self-styled and self-made. And he's seen people doing something that was spiritual and his man-made theology didn't cope with it. What a parallel of today. Honest and sincere in his heart, as many people are. They think that people who's been born again is crazy. They think that divine healing and powers of the Holy Ghost is something that they talk about. But it's true. So when he was on his road down to Damascus one day with some orders in his pocket from the, from the church bishop to go down and destroy all that bunch of holy rollers that were screaming and shouting and, and jumping up and down and speaking with foreign languages and, and healing the sick. And what's well, a bunch of devils, said the theologians. Go down and rest them and bring them back up here in chains. Sure at your service, Bishop. Oh, oh, he was a great man. He had a DD, PhD, you know. So he had jumped on his horse and away he went with the company with him. But on his road about high noon, something floored him. And he wallowed in the dust like a madman frothing. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What was it? Not some theologian speaking to him, but a voice from heaven. (laughs) Why persecutest thou me? And he turned over in the dust and his frowns all full of dust and tears rolling down his cheeks. Perhaps he said, Lord, who are you? And when he flashed his eyes, he become as blind as a bat. There stood the big pillar of fire before him. And a voice coming from it said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Your man-made teaching's been wrong. What was it? There was an open vision. The Word of God was made real. Oh, brethren, that's what we need today is some more like that. I just want to thank the Lord. These little girls in the wheelchairs last night coming walking up today in a, without the wheelchairs of the Lord. <laughs> The Lord bless you, girl. <laughs> what did it? The same Jesus that spoke in a supernatural voice back there speaks yet today. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul was a changed man. And people ought to be changed today. When they can see and hear the voice of the living God speak like He did when He walked in Galilee. Amen. Oh, sure. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What did it? 
Did he take him down to a seminary and teach him some new theology? No, he did not. What did he do? He spoke to him. And there was a literal voice speaking through a cloud. What was it? The same God that thundered off of Mount Sinai. And in the meetings and the places where the Holy Spirit does come, you hear a human voice changed. And not knowing hardly ABCs, but Christ can take that voice and speak out the mysteries of the Almighty God. It ought to change every man and woman that sits in the presence of His hand. I heard a voice, he said. Oh, we so slumber. I hope we not will have to be made any plainer than that. But we so slumber in our churches, in our theology, in our thinking, and in our ways of life until we fail to hear that voice when it speaks. Oh, they say it might be telepathy. It might, you know, it might be this, that, or the other. What if Moses would have said, say, one of that was a demon in that bush? No question to Moses. He heard the voice. If you say, oh, it might be just my conscience telling me that. If you're a child of God, you know it's His voice. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. They'll know. There was another by the name of Peter who had become saved and had also be filled with the Spirit. And he still wanted to hang on to the traditions of the elders. All he had known would have been here in the Word. And one day on a housetop, when he wanted to keep the traditions of don't meet, eat any meat in the Sabbath and so forth, there's a many a good person that still tries to hang on to stuff like that. And one day when he's up on the housetop, he heard a voice that said, Don't you call that what I made clean unclean? God, I wish he would take a bunch of preachers in this daddy here and let them know that we're not crazy. We're not holy rollers, a bunch of trash. It's the Spirit of the living God. And men and women are drunk on His goodness. It's not witchcraft or mental telepathy. It's the Spirit of the living God. Turn loose of your traditions, elders. And listen to the voice of the living God. It'll change you. You won't become one of the persecutors. You want to be one of them. If you can pass the barriers of all your doctrines until you can float into His presence, yonder, something will take place. You won't believe the days of miracles is past. You will believe that they're right here because one to be performed on you. Sure. To change a man. That's what the voice of God always does. It changes men and women. Makes them what they should be. Not what the schools and the teachers has made, but what God has patterned them for. The voice speaking. I heard a voice. Oh, I would like to go into personal experiences. And how that you would love to go to personal testimonies. Many of you men and women who's heard his voice. Now, I can remember hearing it when I was just a little boy. Way down in the mountains of Kentucky. And I thought it was a bird sitting in a tree, but the bird flew away. He said, don't fear because you're going to leave from here someday and live near a city called New Albany. I heard his voice when he said, don't smoke or drink or defile your body with women and so forth. There's a work for you to do when you get older. Oh, he's still the same Lord God. And you hear him hour after hour speaking to you in your teeny little closet, in your prayer room, 
come out before the audiences, then speak visible to the people the voice of God. It was precious in the days of Samuel. It's more precious today. For there was no open vision. Peter heard the voice. And it changed all of his theology. He went right straight to the Gentiles, who he thought to be a bunch of illiterate offcasts. But the voice of God, not his teaching, the voice of the living God changed him. And now just one more. There was a good man one time in the Bible, a personal acquainted with Jesus, who loved him and believed in him and worshipped him and played with him and went into the hills with him and down to the river fishing with him. He was a good man. One day while Jesus was gone, death comes stealing into his room. And he'd left the old Orthodox church, him and his lovely sisters, Martha and Mary. And they'd come out because they loved him and believed him to be the Messiah. And by doing so, the church had quickly excommunicated them. And this young man got so sick until he died. And had been buried four days. What good would theological teachings do then? What good to his church do then? But there was the voice of God on earth. And he spoke to Lazarus. And Lazarus, the man who was dead and corrupted in the grave, heard his voice and come out and lived again. I was dead once in sin and trespasses. You were dead in sin and trespasses. But it was the voice of God that said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I've seen the voice speak to the cripple. Straighten him up. I've seen the voice of God speak to the blind and his eyes come open. To the dying cancer ridden. To the leper. You see him return back and flash into perfect health again. I've seen him speak to the alcoholics and erotics. And the offcast and the skid row bunch. They become ladies and gentlemen and saints of the living God. Because the voice of God spoke. That's what we listen for today. Let me close by saying this. There will come a time that when your wandering soul has been taken from your body and it's in its destination somewhere, wandering yonder in darkness or either into the bosoms of God, that voice will speak again. And the Bible said that all those that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come out. Some shall come to everlasting shame and contentment. And others shall come forth to everlasting peace and joy. This morning might be the time that you make up your mind. Whether you're going to listen to what the television says or what the paper says or what the theologians say or what God says. Let me tell you as a people... Don't you listen to what anything says, but what God says. Wait on that still, small voice. And He will change you. You say, I'd like to believe, Brother Branham. I wished I could believe. I wished I could do certain things. But you can't. Why? You don't get quite long enough. You don't get into a place to where the, the doubts are all gone. When you enter into the place where the doubts have passed away, then you'll be free and you can hear the voice of God speaking. Child of mine, I am your Savior. Child of mine, I am your healer. You don't have to do these things. I died that you might be free. But as long as you're down here in this vibration mixed up with all kinds of voices, just whirl away from all of them. Reminds me of a time when I was up in the mountains once... 
And I shall never forget them experiences. And here about ten years ago, or hardly so long, I was helping Mr. Jeffries on the roundup. And when I, they was, uh, I was having salt on the horses. And I was taking them to certain licks where I could lay them out where the cattle would know to come. Way back 70 miles almost from civilization. Or I mean about 30 miles. 35, maybe 40 miles to Kremlin, Colorado. To where you hit into a little city with a population of about seven or 800 people. And I had my horse and I had the saddlebags I'd unloaded. And we look at the, hunt the cattle through the binoculars. And I hooked my horse to a limb and the trailers was behind him, which is the horse, the bell horses in front. And I went up on the hills and it was so pretty. It was a springtime and I was a looking across the valleys, watching the little ripples of water way in the distance. And as I watched, it was in the mid-afternoon. And I seen something that stirred me. I seen an old mother taking her babies from her nest, an old eagle bird. And she fluttered around over them till she got them on her wings and they'd been out of the nest before. But she tucked them down into the valley. They'd never been down there before. They're just learning to fly. So she let them off and they went along picking on the grass and tumbling over one another just as carefree as they could be. And while sitting there, I thought, now, isn't that just like a group of real believing Christians? They're carefree. Why was they carefree? They didn't have to fear anything. Because Mama had went right on back up and sat down on a rock to watch them. Oh, that just changes itself. When you get to thinking, what will Pastor so-and-so think if I happen to get the Holy Spirit? What will a a bishop so-and-so say? I don't care what they say. Jesus died. And he's climbed the rapports of glory. And he sits in the heavens of heavens. There ain't nothing going to bother you. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. And he watches you. And then... When there come, if there should come a coyote or something to disturb one of these little ones, why she did better not. She could pick up a coyote in her hand, in her paws. Came up about several thousand feet and just turn him loose. He would disintegrate in the air. <laughs> Nothing's going to bother them little ones. She's going to see to it. Nothing's going to bother you. Don't be scared to take God at His word. Just relax and have faith and believe. He's watching over you. He'll disintegrate anything that tries to bother you. Or it might attack at you. But it can't harm you. For all things He permits it, it couldn't be nothing else for it's working together for good to them that love the Lord. No harm can come to you. And so, after a while, there come a storm up. And when the storm started, it comes quick, those northerners, a little flash of lightning and that wind coming 60 or 70 miles an hour. And that old mother eagle let out a great big scream and down through the valley she went. And that scream, what did it do? Them little eagles knew their mama's voice. My sheep know my voice, he said. Danger was at hand. Now, they didn't try to get under chunks. They didn't try to run out into some kind of a trash pile. They just waited on mama. That's what the Christians should do. See what God's going to do about it. And when the, the old mother hit the ground, them great big feet about like that, she just sailed down like a great mammoth plane setting down. And she threw her head in the air and screamed. And she threw those big wings out about 14 feet from tip to tip. Why it's this pole to that one? All those little eagles just run as hard as they could and jumped right on their mammy's wings. Reached right down and got a hold with their little paws, tucked their little beaks and got a hold of one of them tight feathers in there. Mama just tucked them without a vibration of those wings and lifted up into that wind. Right straight into the rock she went to hide them from the storm that was coming. Oh, brother, the storm is close at hand. 
Hear his voice that calls to you, come out of Babylon, be separated. Don't be partakers of his, their sins. And I'll receive you. You'll be sons and daughters to me. I'll be God unto you. Let us bow our heads just a moment in the closing. heard that. That's what we call prophecy in the church. Would there be some here this morning, which I know there is, that would say, Lord God, be merciful to me. Although I have joined church, I've made a confession, but I, I don't know what it is to get quiet before you and hear your voice leading me and teaching me. I wouldn't know what to do if you should speak to me in an audible voice. I would love to know you so that you could speak to me and direct my paths. Would you raise your hands just now and say, God, be merciful. The Lord bless you everywhere. Hands everywhere. Just continue putting them up. That's right. Lord, be merciful unto me. I need you so much. Would there be some more just before closing? God sees your hands back there, lady, and all you way in the back and standing in the rows and so forth. God sees you, even to the platform up around here. And Samuel said, Eli, did you call me? Eli said, no, my son, I never called you. That wasn't me that spoke to your heart, friend. That was God. Just speak back and say, Thy servant heareth. Take me into your care today, God. Let me from this day be wholly thine. Eternal God, lover of the soul, creator of all things, while that still small voice of God that spoke to Samuel, that spoke to Saul, that spoke to Peter, that spoke to Daniel and Isaiah the prophet and all down to the ages, has spoke again this morning in the tabernacle. Perhaps maybe 30 or 40 or maybe 50 hands of sinners and church members and People with flusterations raise their hands. Many of them were here last night. And they heard your voice come audible. And now this morning that same voice speaks down deep in their heart. They've raised their hands with their hands towards heaven. Saying that they're wrong and they want to be right. You have said in your word that no man can come to me except my father draws him first. And all that will come, I'll give them eternal life and will raise him up at the last day. You promised it, Father. And now we call upon thee as your servant to give to these who has raised their hands eternal life and eternal joy. And may they live for thee all the days of their life and at the end of the road of life's journey enter into the joys of the Lord. Grant it, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> How many of you love Him with all your heart? Just all your heart. Now, in these little places here, like this, I'm just late. But the Bible said that we sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes, gets into the Word, moves down to the audience, and you can just watch it when it sweeps over and changes them. 
as I have said, I believe in emotions, sure. But you, what? See, emotions doesn't change you. Emotions has got to go plumb until it touches the morals of your being. That's what changes you. From sinful, what is a sinner? Unbeliever. There's a many a person today with a, a bachelor of art degree, with a doctor's degree, with a Ph.D. and double L.D. on their name, and still sinners. Knows the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. Preaches in the pulpit and still believe, disbelievers. The Bible said, He that believeth not is condemned already. Ask one of them people if they believe the Holy Ghost is for today. Well, certainly not. Do you believe that divine healing is? That? Well, certainly not. Then he is a unbeliever. Right. If the Holy Spirit is in you, won't he testify to his own word? Amen. And if the Spirit in you testifies contrary to what God says is true, it's not the Spirit of Christ. You might belong to the church of Christ, but you're none of Christ. Until your spirit says amen to every promise God made. And when he promised, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, he said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if your spirit says that was for another day, what did the scripture say? For the promise isn't to you, the Jew. And to your children, and to them as far off, the Gentile, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The same promise. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And if that's the doctrine of the branch, first branch, the second branch has to have the same doctrine. And the same doctrine will produce the same results. And as each branch comes on the vine, it'll produce the same thing. I'm glad this morning. I'm so glad that I know that the Spirit of the living God still talks and speaks to people and confirms His Word. Amen. We're going into baptismal service just in a few moments. If you've been sprinkled, poured, or immersed any way, then in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're ch challenged to come to the water. Now you say, Brother Branham, would you mean to tell me Yes, brother, Franklin is not spoke of in the Bible. There's no place in the Bible where anybody was ever sprinkled. I remember this. I've asked this desk all week. Find me where one person in the Bible was ever sprinkled for the remission of their sins, ever poured for the remission of sins, or ever baptized by immersing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost for the remission of their sins. There never was a person ever sprinkled, poured, or baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost in the entire lids of the Bible. No, sir. They were, they were some people baptized one time by John the Baptist. And they wasn't baptized in any name at all. And they were baptized by the same man that baptized Jesus. But Paul, when he met him in Acts 19, told them they had to come and be baptized over again in the name of Jesus Christ. Or they could not receive the Holy Ghost as yet. When Peter found some that had received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized at all, he commanded them and stayed with them until they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's true, friend. I know a lot of people say, Now, Brother Branham's a Jesus only. That's wrong. I just believe the Scriptures. I don't belong to any of the denominations. And Jesus only don't baptize that way anyhow. They just baptize the name of Jesus. The Bible said the Lord Jesus Christ. There's many Jesuses, but only one Lord Jesus Christ. See, Christ is the Messiah. See, and that's right. And now, friends, now you that's here this morning and never been baptized that way, may God's still small voice speak down deep in your soul and regardless of what bishop, what church, what anything else says, come and obey the Lord is my command to you. And now, Brother Neville, will go to this room for make ready for the baptismal service. And those who are, are getting the things ready, some of the elders will go with me. I'll be with you in there just in a minute. But I want those who are coming now, when we're going to sing, I can hear my Savior calling. I'll go with Him. Regardless of what church, I'll go with Him. Regardless of what anybody, I'll go with Him all the way. Let the...
the man make their way to this room and the women make their way to this room as we sing now. And we're going to be dismissed officially just in a moment now. All right. All together now. I can hear my Savior calling. Now the men go here. The women over here. My Savior. Some of the women go in here with these women, please. I can hear my Savior. What did you hear? His voice? Take my cross and follow, follow me where ye. Now, do you really mean it? I say this, friend, I heard a voice. And if the voice didn't speak according to the voice of God here, it's the wrong voice. But my sheep know my voice. How can you come? Here's the reason you come. is because your name was put on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. The Bible said so. Think of a person who's sitting and knows that that is the gospel truth and yet something holding him, knowing that perhaps her name wasn't put on. Then what? In vain do they worship me. In vain? Oh, you say, I'm a loyal man. I'm a loyal... I don't have one thing to do with it. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. I've told you there's nobody sprinkled, poured, or baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost in the Bible. Search it. Find it. If it is, come show me on the platform tonight. Then if you've been done that way, you're following man's tradition. And if somebody tells you, well, you come up and make your confession, you receive the Holy Ghost then. That's wrong. That's man-made doctrine. There's a false water baptism. There's a false Holy Spirit baptism. The devil is impersonated because he's religious. Cain, his father, was religious. As we've been through it, the seed of the serpent still goes on. And the seed of the woman through Christ still goes on. But no man can come except my father draws him. Now think of sun setting here this morning that knows that you're baptized falsely in a man's creed and not according to the Bible, and your first birth of confession is wrong. How can you ever be right unless you go back and start right? You remember this week I had preached? It wasn't so from the beginning. Now, and if you can hear a voice speaking to you, that's God, because it copes with the Scripture. If it doesn't, then there's some kind of a wrong voice speaking to you. But the right voice will tell you to follow the rules of the Bible. No sprinkling, no pouring, no falsely. Come right straight out and follow the rules of the Bible. Do it, friends. If it took everything, I don't care what it would cost. I'll lay aside everything to follow the Lord Jesus. Hear my voice, my sheep will. And will come to me. And all that will come to me, I'll give him everlasting life and raise him up in the last days. Is it right? Here it is right with the Scriptures. No one can disprove that. That's right. No one can disprove that. Here it is in the power of the Spirit doing the same things that Jesus did. Here he is on picture. The same pillar of fire. Moving the same fruit, same Spirit. Having the same emotions, same actions, same signs, same wonders. There you are. Hear the voice of God this morning. 
And the voice said, Samuel, he said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, here I am. Here is your servant. Here is your servant. I'll follow. God bless the lady. I'll, you say, Brother Brandon, you make that awful strong. I mean for it to be strong. It's between life and death, so I must make it strong. The Lord be with you is my sincere prayer. Now, before they move the furniture of the building here to have the, so that you can see the baptism, the place is open at all times. I want to read some right straight from the scripture so that you'll see that I'm, I'm reading. Jesus Christ in the 16th chapter of St. Matthew, I believe, told Peter, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. Do you all know that? On the day of Pentecost, when the kingdom of God had come in the fullness of its power. Do you believe that? Peter standing now when Jesus rose from the dead, he did not have the keys of the kingdom. Is that right? He had the keys of death and hell, not the keys to the kingdom. And here's what he said when he was preaching. And they were hearing these things and it hardened their heart. Here's exactly what Peter said. Now listen close as I read the scriptures so that you'll understand. Acts, the second chapter. Remember, how many was here to hear the sermon? It wasn't so from the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning and see what baptism, baptizing really is. How should we be baptized? Sprinkled, poured, or in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You remember, I've challenged any minister, any bishop, anybody, anywhere, anytime to show me one scripture where any person has ever sprinkled, poured, or baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's open. It's not in the scriptures. No, it's a false made creed started by the Catholic Church. Sprinkling was formed by the Catholic Church. About 600 years after the death of the last disciple. The Father, Son, Holy Ghost was adapted at the same time because Catholic people worshipped different gods. And they made the trinity of the offices of God. Not three gods, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's pagan. There's one God. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Hear you, O Israel, I'm the Lord your God, one God. The Jew asks us, which is your God, the Father, Son, or Holy Ghost? They're just one of them. It's three offices that the same God has worked in, manifesting himself first in the Father, could not be touched, hung on the mountain, even the cow or animal would touch the mountain should be killed. Then he came down because he wanted to be worshipped. He got closer to man because he became the son of man. God was in him. And when he did that, then he said, a little while and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I, a personal pronoun, I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. He said, I come from God. What? The pillar of fire? I go back to God. He did. He did. And then when he did that, he went back to God. Then we find Paul in our lesson this morning on his road to Damascus, and he found Paul down on the road. And he smote him down. And when Paul looked up, what was he? The pillar of fire again. A light that put his eyes out. Look what Jesus done when he was on earth. And told the woman her sins. Done all these things and said, I do nothing except the Father shows me first. They asked him, said, why don't you go down there and heal them people down there? Passed through a great multitude where lame, halt, blind, and withered. He healed a man with prostrate trouble or something laying on a pallet. So why don't you make the whole bunch of them? He said, Verily, verily, St. John 5, 19 now. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son. Here he has come again in this last days. The scientific world can't denounce it. The church can't denounce it. Here it is, come right back into the church and doing the same thing. The Spirit... God wants those who will worship in the Spirit and in the truth. Here he is. Here's what he said on the day of Pentecost. Peter preaching. This Jesus has God raised up. Where are we are all witnesses? Are we witnesses? Wherefore, being at the right hand of God, exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. 
For David is not ascended into heaven, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Let therefore all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. Now, when they heard this, that was the religious people. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Man and brethren, what shall we do? Shall we just go and be good? And... No, no. Watch out, Peter. You have the keys to the kingdom now. What you tell them, God said, I'll lock it in heaven when you lock it on earth. Peter said unto them, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. One more scripture. Thirty-two years after that, Paul, over here in the 19th chapter, Paul, having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, he finds certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Baptist, let that sink into you. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? It's a birth, not a confession. We not know where there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto what was you baptized then? They'd been baptized. Un unto John. Paul said unto them, John verily baptized unto repentance, not for remission of sins, unto repentance, saying that you should believe on him that is come, that is on Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul laid his hands upon them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke in tongues and magnified God. Now, let me take you, Paul, closing his epistle. Galatians 1.8. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you've already heard, let him be unto you a curse. I might take you also to Corinthians, the 14th chapter, 38th verse, where it said, If any man professes to be spiritual or a prophet, let him acknowledge that what I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if he be ignorant, just let him be ignorant. What are we going to do about it? Every evidence. If I was in your place and had not been baptized according to Christian baptism, regardless of what my church thought or what my mother thought, I want to know what my Lord commands. Lord Jesus, it's yours now. And I pray that you'll work on every heart and give these who are in the pool to be baptized the Holy Spirit as they wait upon you. In Jesus' name, we commit the crowd to you that on that day, Lord, may I not be guilty, but free from the blood of all men, not standing by some tradition or some denomination or organization, but by standing by your word. Amen.